unprecedented times as we are in today lead to unprecedented opportunities. Don't let the environment stifle you. Tonight, Greg and I will show you how to pivot, how to overcome obstacles, and also how to pull ahead of the pack. Guests, and especially CBS Asian Alumni Club members. Let's get started. So let me start with what is speaking anxiety or what is any type of anxiety? Anxiety in today's modern world is something that sets your heart a flutter. It makes your palms sweaty. It just makes you so nervous. Your throat closes up. You feel sweaty. You just look anxiety ridden. That's what anxiety is in the modern world today but it's caused by modern perils. So what those are is you can start a virtual presentation and you're going along on that presentation and it just bombs. Your lighting is bad, your audio is bad, you're dropping on your connection. So what happens when you are faced with those types of issues? You feel like you can lose your reputation. You can be losing out on those opportunities. Tonight, we want to change all of that and give you all the tips and tools to be as successful as you can be. I want to first start off with a story. And I recently actually heard this story from Tony Robbins. I was very fortunate just the other day to be in a meeting with him and obviously many others as he's coaching us through these difficult times. So he told this story about an individual who went to college and in his all four years of college, he was so fearful of public speaking, he didn't take one course that required him to speak, to get up in front of the room, to say his name out loud in front of the class. No, he didn't do that but he managed to get through school without having to do any public speaking, which is amazing. So when he graduated at the age of 21, he became a stockbroker. And at that time he realized he needed to address that fear of public speaking, that deep anxiety he had. So we had to do one of two things. He had to push forward and hit it head on or he had to realize that his potential was capped, that he just wasn't going to be who he could ultimately be. So what he did is he decided to enroll himself in some self-education. And I know many of you have heard of Dale Carnegie and the Dale Carnegie speaking course. This individual enrolled himself in that. And lo and behold, when he started class, there were 29 others in the class that had the same anxiety issues as he did, he was not alone. He did make it through that class with flying colors. He was very determined to be able to public speak and to be a success. So that individual is one of the most prosperous individuals on our planet. His name is Warren Buffett and he is worth about $65 billion. I mean, what an incredible turnaround story and look where he's at today. So today, we are gonna show you how to enhance your skills through three different ways. One, we're gonna show you self-hypnosis techniques to eradicate those, those public speaking anxiety and the fears. Second, we're gonna give you tips for delivering compelling virtual presentations. And lastly, we're going to share with you leading practices to engage online audiences, to get their attention and to get your point across. So please type in the chat, all in, so that we can welcome Greg. We wanna welcome Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. I think I need to... On. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melinda. I'm glad I could be here tonight to help you with some of these issues. And I'm assuming that's why you're here, right? You saw the link and it said, 
helping with speaking anxiety. Luckily, you're not going to be doing any speaking anxiety. You're speaking right now live for the most part, but it's going to come really quickly here as soon as things start to get back to normal again. And if you're struggling with that issue, we've got a way for you to deal with it straight up. And it's not only for public speaking, but it will help you with lots of other types of anxiety. And since I've discovered this, I've used it with many different things that I struggle with daily. I've shared it with many of my family members and friends on how to deal with these things through self-hypnosis. It's a really easy technique. And some of you may have actually seen it or heard of it before. It's, it's not like we're going to mesmerize you into and have you in our control as you might see on some of the shows and you've been to an event where they do that. Uh, it is really your conscious the whole time that it's going on, right? And so this in particular self-hypnosis you can use throughout the course of your day some people suggest doing it multiple times a day. I often will do it twice a day, but just as a way to set myself, it's very akin to meditation, to set myself into the right place so that I'm very intentional subconsciously about the things that I choose to speak about and the things that I want to say and do for that day. So I'm going to walk you through this technique on how you could do it yourself. Now, this is not, I'm not going to hypnotize you. I'm going to show you how to do it. So we're going to give you some notes afterwards, but keep in mind, you could take notes while you're doing this. I don't expect you to go through the process and, and do the actual hypnosis right now, but we're going to walk you through how it's done so that I'm, I'm going to teach you how to fish rather than give you a fish, right? And so after this is done, you should be able to know how to put yourself into a trance. And you should also know how to suggest things to you that you'd like to work on and use these methods to enforce that in ways that will make it beneficial for you in the future. So without any further ado, let's get started here. I'd like you to make sure that you are in a comfortable seat right now. I'm sure you're all sitting down, so that shouldn't be a problem. Have your hands perhaps flat on the sides of the chair and your feet flat on the floor. One of the things that people misconstrue is that somehow that self-hypnosis or any type of hypnosis is sleep. It's not sleep, right? You're not asleep. You're totally conscious, but you can get tired. And some people have been known to fall asleep in it. Now, if you're one of these people that you, you're akin to falling asleep or you're easily hypnotized, if you've ever done it before, I would suggest that you find a chair that has a headrest on it. But for most of us, it's probably not necessary. And... As you're doing that, I want you to just start thinking about breathing. We're going to start taking some breaths. And the breath work is something that some of you may have covered before as well. And in and of itself, this breath work can be used for simple relaxation, but it also helps you to get into a trance. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. So the breath work is very simple. When you breathe in, typically you expand, believe it or not, you expand your diaphragm, your stomach goes out. So I want you to just take a deep breath. And when you do that, push your stomach out. And you're going to count to three as you breathe in. So it's one, two, three, and your stomach is going to go out when you do that. And while you do that, on the count of three, you're going to hold that breath for three seconds. One, two, three. And then when you let that breath out, you're going to count six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. So breathe in three, hold it for three, and breathe out for six. Again, I, I'm just showing you how to do it. You don't have to do that this time, but if you want to go along with me at the same time, you're more than welcome to do that. And then after you've take, given out those, those six breaths or six seconds, wait four seconds before you take another breath. And typically, at the first couple times you're going to do that, you can have your eyes open. But then as time starts to progress, maybe two or three times, you're then going to close your eyes and you're going to breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. Same sequence, three, three, six, four. And you're going to do that maybe five, six, maybe 10 times. That's all you're going to need. And at that point, you're going to start thinking of a word. There's going to be two words. This is the first set of words that I want you to remember here. The first words are as follows, and you can write these down since we're not actually doing it. The first words that you're going to look for are either, um, I'm sorry, where's my list here? Uh, physical words, heavy, floating, relaxation, 
lightness, loose, tingling, or limp. And these are all physical words that you're going to repeat while you've gotten yourself into this trance. And you're just gonna take whatever that is. For instance, if I use the word loose, and you can adapt all of these to your own situation, but you're moving that word and the sensation of that word throughout your body. Typically you start at your head. So now you've relaxed yourself, you're comfortable. And if I use the word loose, I think of something very loose, like perhaps water or honey or something just floating down my head. And at the same time, I feel loose. I just keep telling myself that everything is loose as that, that sensation makes its way down my head to my eyes. My eyelids are loose. My nose is loose. My lips are loose. My earlobes are loose. My neck becomes loose. My shoulders become loose. And this generally can take anywhere from a minute to five minutes if you really wanted to push it that far. In the beginning, you may want to do it a little longer until you get roughly to your midsection and to your hands and your arms and you've conveyed that sense of looseness. You feel it emanating from your body at that point. Now, as you've done that, you're gonna finally come to a conclusion. You're gonna count down from three, two, one. Now, this is the second portion of the, the trance that you're going to get in. At this point, you're going to ask, you're gonna choose another one of these words and you'll get notes on this eventually as well. So don't worry about forgetting it. And these words are as follows. Pick whichever one you feel most comfortable with. And these are emotional words. These will help you to get into a trance more. And that is calmness, confidence, success, happiness, joy, contentment, or peace. One of that, I'll repeat them again. Calmness, confidence, success, happiness, joy, contentment, and peace. So just to recap again, you've done your breath work, you've chosen your physical word, you've counted that down after uh, the continued breathing, and you've counted down from three, two, one on that. And, and by the way, in the midst of that physical word, you're just gonna repeat that. Every time you breathe, throughout that first section, however long you do, just keep repeating if your word was loose or whatever it was, just keep repeating that. And then we're gonna, and then you're counting down and now you're gonna do the same thing again for your, your emotional word. But there's a twist here. The emotional word, you're going to actually step down a bunch of steps. You're gonna see in your head a stairway and there's going to be 20 steps on it. And so every time you step, you're going to repeat that emotional word. So if yours is joy, happiness, or confidence, you're going to take a step starting at 20, and you're going to go down one, 19, 18, confidence is what I use, 17, confidence. You don't have to repeat it every time, but you can just repeat it maybe every other time until you get to the bottom and you're going three, confidence, two, confidence, one, and then zero. And at this point, you're going to say deep sleep. And at this point, you're in a trance. Now, if you're here tonight to work on public speaking anxiety, I will give you an example of a good way to, to offer yourself some suggestions while you're in this trance net for public speaking anxiety. You're going to think of a couple things. One of them is you're going to think of a color. Typically, to, to get away from anxiety, you think of something like yellow or perhaps blue. And you would think of that color and you'd say to yourself, in the middle of this trance, now that you're there, you're going to intentionally say, I feel blue and I see myself in a positive state where I have no fear at all for public speaking, none at all. You're gonna repeat that, I have no fear of public speaking, no fear at all, and you're gonna see that color blue. And you're just simply gonna repeat that throughout the course of this trance until you feel like you've had enough. There's no particular uh, reason or, or choice of things that you'd like to choose, but whatever you want to work on, I've chosen public speaking anxiety because it's the nature of this course and associate it with a color. You could see yourself. Oftentimes a good way to do this is to see yourself in that position where you're speaking to people and you're not afraid. You've all done it. You may think that you have the fear, but you've all done this in front of people, whether it's a couple people, family members, friends, you've all spoken to people, see yourself in that time when you felt really good, when you felt strong, when you felt like you had no fear at all. Just visualize it, smell it, feel it, touch it, have that, feel that feeling, all those senses at that time and associate it with that color. And then if you wanna do that for a different problem that you're dealing with, 
maybe it's weight loss, maybe it's exercise. You could do the exact same thing. Pick a color, feel how you feel when you're in that positive place, and then repeat it three times, four times, just however long you feel comfortable with. Again, this whole process probably shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. So however long you have at this point, just keep repeating it until you feel like you've done it enough. And then you're gonna count back from, from five all the way back to, to one. So five, getting a little bit more weight, four, a little bit more, three, a little bit more, two, your eyes are starting to get less tired, one, your eyes open, and then you need to say to yourself, wake up. And that's it. Now, I would suggest that if you do this throughout the course of any number of days, and, and if you have fear of public speaking or anything else, after two or three sessions of this, you will be aware of your anxiety at a minimum and a maximum at best, you're going to overcome it so that you will, you will potentially feel that anxiety, you will potentially be afraid, but more than likely, it's going to go away and it's, it's going to diminish significantly. And again, I suggest you highly suggest you do this with other issues in your life, but tonight for public speaking, it's a real easy way for you to overcome that fear. So uh, without that, that's my portion of the meeting. And, and at the beginning here, what I would like to suggest to you is that this is a way that you start dealing with public speaking. If you've ever, I'm sure when you were in school, you had a fear of it. You didn't want to do it. You, you, and one of the reasons for that is typically you're seeing people, you're seeing your tribe. It's, it's, it's evolutionary. You're seeing your tribe of people looking at you. You're seeing their faces and it makes you fearful, right? This is a great way to start. And now we're going to work on, once you've overcome that fear, how to deal with getting a great presentation out there. And, and then we'll follow up with um, some additional tips on how to do that virtually. So next is going to be Melinda, and she's gonna to talk to us about how to put a great presentation on, how to present in a way that you're no longer afraid and give you some great content. So without any further ado, Melinda. Thank you, Greg. So next, I'm gonna be teaching you tips on how you can prepare for your virtual meetings to just hit it out of the park. The first area that I want to cover related to virtual meetings is four key technical parts. Those four key parts are lighting, background, camera, and audio. Starting with lighting, many of you I'm sure have done many virtual meetings, you know, in the last couple of, of months here especially since we've been affected by COVID. And so you've probably seen times where your lighting is good and your lighting may not be so good. The key here to lighting is you want the light in front of you so that it shines on your face and you can see your facial expressions. You can see your eyes. You can connect with the audience. So if your computer camera faces a window, that's going to be a problem, especially during the day, because the light will come in through that window and it will force shadows on your face. So you can't connect with the audience. They just see a more blackened face. So my suggestion is if you can't move your computer to then close the shades or try to darken it up as much as possible. The other thing that helps is put lighting. You can use a lamp or anything in lighting in your house. You can set it in front of your computer screen and turn that on and see how that lighting affects your face and how it lights up your torso and your face. So give that a try. Many people I know have bought supplemental lighting such as the ring, which I'm sure many of you've seen and heard. I actually do have one and it works really well because there's different types of lighting and different intensities of the light you can, you can use to really highlight yourself. Lighting is so key to a virtual presentation. It's key to engaging the audience, to getting your point across. So make sure you 
look at your lighting and see that you have yourself set up for success. The second thing is background. So currently now I am using a virtual background. When you use a virtual background, you have to select something that pertains to your image that enhances what you are speaking about that really helps you along with your story. So I today pick this virtual background and it's puzzle pieces and that's what we're doing today. We're putting all the pieces of the puzzle together to get the best virtual presentation we can. Now, for those of you that don't want to do virtual backgrounds and just use the virtual room you're in, you can, you can do that too. But what I'm gonna recommend you do is check out the area. Make sure if you have piles of paper behind you or next to you, and you can see that on a camera, that's not a really good image you want to portray. So move papers out of the way. If you have a lot of colors, a lot of knickknacks, a lot of um, uh, picture that has a lot of colors in it, see if you can angle your camera in a different way. So as your background can be as neutral as it can. And the focus is on you, is on engaging your audience and making sure they connect with you and hearing your message virtually. So background is another thing that's important. The third thing is camera. So many of us have laptops and our cameras in our laptop and the lens is, is there. You have to know where that lens is. On this laptop here, it's in a not, not the best place. Mine is by where the keyboard is. Usually they're on the top, on the top of the monitor, but mine is not. So that presents myself with other problems. So make sure you know where that camera is and where the lens is. What you need to do is you need to have your camera at the level of your eyes, at the level of where you're going to speak. So what you can do to do that, if you've got a laptop or even a desktop, or, or maybe you have just a side camera, you can prop it up on boxes. I know many of us have many Amazon boxes, um, if you keep them, if you can keep them in your apartment, but use a box, use books to prop it up, to prop up your camera. So make sure that it's at an eye level because to engage the audience, to connect with the audience, to get through to the audience, when you are the presenter, you need to be looking at them in the eye, or in the eyes, I should say. And doing that is looking at that camera lens, looking directly at the camera lens. Many people have a tendency to look up to the audience. I will cover that in the next set of suggestions I have, but if you're the only presenter, you need to know where that lens is and connect and engage people. The last technical piece is audio. So make sure that you've turned off all the external or muted all the external things that can happen in your environment, such as computer dings, your phone. If you're in a room, make sure you close the windows so you don't hear outside noises. And also make sure you close the door. If you're working from home, make sure you tell other people in your household you are on a presentation so they don't barge in or there isn't other noise that you can hear through the door. So make sure you have your audio covered on that regard. The other thing too is sometimes your audio, your speaker on your computer is not the best. It can sound tinny, especially depending on your room. If you have high ceilings, it may sound more echo echoey. So, you may want to think about getting an additional microphone. I actually bought that and it helps out tremendously with uh, just controlling the, the loudness and picking up my voice. So with all these four technical parts, you have to practice before your meeting. Even if you've done it before, you never know what may happen on a specific virtual meeting. So get on either your Zoom, on your Microsoft Team meetings, whatever platform you're using for the virtual meeting, get on. Check your lighting, check your background, check your camera. Record yourself. Can you hear yourself? 
it is key that you do it before any meeting starts, before any meeting virtual, virtual meeting starts, and in particular one that you're presenting at. Next, I wanna move on to virtual body language. Now you're thinking, virtual body language? How can that be? There are three specific body language techniques that I wanna cover that are so important to virtual presentations. The first one is, and we talked about this a little bit with the camera, is perfecting your eye contact. And there's two scenarios I wanna cover. The first scenario is where you're joining a virtual meeting. You're participating, but you're not the primary speaker. It, or it could be a collaboration session where everybody is asked to speak and comment and share ideas. So in that case, it is okay to look at the screen. So I'm looking at the screen now, and it's okay to do that. You wanna see the body language of the people who are in the meeting. Do they agree? Are they being um, obstinate against an idea? You wanna see if they're smiling, if they're not smiling, if they're frowning. So in that instance, in that scenario, it's okay to look at the screen. You don't have to keep that eye contact when you're not speaking with that lens. But if you are a main speaker, such as I am a main speaker here, you have to know where that lens is and you have to speak into that camera. That is very important. That is how you make eye contact. That is how you are connecting with the audience. That's how you're engaging with the audience. You don't want your main speaker, you don't want to be handling chats. You don't want to be handling any Zoom techniques, Microsoft team techniques. You need someone else to do that or to help you out, a colleague, when you are the main speaker. You should be focused on that audience and looking at that audience. Next is hand gestures. People think when they're virtual, you, know, you don't, you only see a portion of you, you know, your head and part of your torso. But I would be careful to think like that because at times you may move back, which shows more of your torso, or you may move closer, which shows more of your head. But just assume that people are going to see what you're doing. They can see you multitasking. They can see you taking a phone call. They can see you texting. They can see what you're doing, looking at papers, reading papers. So hand gestures are the same thing. You want to make sure just as you do in an, uh, in an in-person meeting to use hand gestures. So if you want to make a point, you can, you know, put your hands forth to make that point. If you want to talk about a small item, a small item, or a large issue, I'm, my hands may be a little bit out the screen there, but you need to practice that too, or a large issue. So make sure that you also use hand gestures that you aren't frozen. In particular, you may do that more if you're seated, and we'll get to that piece too on the next, on the next topic. And that is confident body gestures. I choose, if I'm the main speaker, I usually choose to stand, and that's what I'm doing now. When you stand, you, act, you actually have, it's found to have better gestures, better body movement, and you're more straight. Your posture is good. You're more engaged with the audience. But that doesn't mean you can't sit in a meeting because most of us do. On meetings, corporate meetings, we do sit. Here's my suggestion if you're gonna sit and you're gonna present. Make sure that you sit on the first half of the seat. Don't put your back against the back, rest on the back. Make sure you put, put, sit on the first half of the seat. And next, lean forward. I'm leaning forward, I'm standing, but lean forward just a bit. That's what shows the audience you are engaged. You are connected to them. You want the audience to get your points, and this is what you're doing. You're making your points with eye contact, hand gestures, and your posture. When you're not speaking, it's okay to relax and sit back a bit, but don't sit with your hands like this when you're listening after you're finished speaking in a meeting. It shows that you may be closed off to the idea 
or it can just be disrespectful. So don't, you know, sit back with your hands like, like this. You probably wouldn't do that in a meeting live. So don't do that virtually. So be careful of those types of things you do. So in summary, there's four key technical parts to a virtual meeting, lighting, background, camera, and audio. And there's three specific body language points that you should be cognizant of, eye contact, hand gestures, and your body posture. The world has changed for now, and we all feel that deeply. Embrace the change to virtual. Accept the challenge to being virtual. Use these tips to up your game, up your virtual game. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Greg, and he can show us how to engage a virtual audience and how for an audience to stay engaged with you. Greg? Thanks, Melinda. So as everybody knows, we've now gone to this virtual world that we probably just a couple years ago would have never thought we would be in. I don't think there's any meeting or any organization that I've been a part of that we would ever thought we would be meeting like this. And, and yet things still go on. And actually we're kind of fortunate if you think about it because just a few years ago, this wouldn't even be possible. All the groups, schools, all these different things that we engage in wouldn't be possible. And I will say this, it seems like things are starting to turn and, and potentially this, this could come to an end. However, I suspect it's going to be a very long time before people feel comfortable and want to move forward to a live meeting. And so we're going to continue to see virtual meetings or hybrid versions of that. So Melinda and I are both in Toastmasters. Uh, they have now suggested that they're not going to do any kind of official meetings until June of next year. So that's, that's potentially uh, the, the end date for this. But that doesn't mean that people in the meantime can't meet in a hybrid fashion. And so when you're in a virtual meeting like this, there are some drawbacks as you know, we we're trying to show you some ways that you can engage in a better fashion with people, but it's going to affect you. You can't necessarily control what's going on. And I'm going to talk about some of those drawbacks and how you can deal with them. One of the main ones is the physical connection and the feedback that you get from people in a live event versus a, a virtual event. And again, this is going to complete, make things even more complex because it's going to be hybrid going forward. So imagine I'm here talking to people right now, and yet I still have to pay attention to people online. And believe me, that is, that's been going on in Toastmasters for quite a while now. There's many clubs that have both virtual and live events before COVID that happened. Um, but here's the thing. It, it's not going to make, it's not going to be that difficult to adapt. And I think that we're going to like it. We're going to like the, the way that it comes out and it's going to make it easier for all of us if you just follow a few of these tips. Now, one of the first things that we, we'd like to do is to make sure that uh, we, we could put a face to the name and that we have to use the videos, right? And because Everybody that's looking at me right now, all of you that are online now, you're looking at my facial cues, you're looking at my posture and my stance if I'm standing up. And in addition to the words that I'm saying, body language is a huge part of it. We all know that, right? And you're still going to see that in a virtual event. But in order for me to get the feedback from you, I need you to be standing too. And I need to be looking at you or not standing. I need you to be online. So I really, I, we don't have to do it now, but when you're in an event that can accord uh, people having video on, ask them to turn their video on. It, it makes a big difference for you as the speaker and the presenter to see what other people are doing. And you know this if you've spoken before live, that seeing people's reactions is critically important. But of course, in the event that it's not possible, make sure that you allow them to at least have an audio form, you know, some type of audio option. It, it, you know, we need to have a good internet connection. If you don't have a good internet connection, then, you know, audio may be the only solution at that point. But the, the other key is that, that having people on video 
gives them the understanding and the connection. It, that human connection by seeing somebody live is so much more different than any kind of audio or email or anything along those lines. When I, I'm in sales and if I can send you a video of me trying to you know, tell you why I'm calling you or why I want to engage, that's gonna have a much bigger impact than me just sending an email or leaving you a voicemail. And the same thing should be said for your virtual meeting. So, you know, people are 47% more likely to ask a question at a virtual event if it's if they're on video. So, let's see the outcome of your engagement. Here here's some of the ways that you can make it a little bit better. Make sure that you have a lot of passion and and that you're a conversational speaker when you're speaking in virtual form as well, because we have a tendency to use a crutch. If, you, if, if any of you have had to present virtually recently, you know that there's the ability to put a uh, uh, notes up and, and people can't see that. So you can read those notes. Uh, I have an outline here, right? And I'm looking at that, but I'm still conversational. I'm not reading verbatim from the script. And, and that's critically important, even more so when it's a virtual like this. So you have to make sure, and, and, and also keep in mind the topic. If it's a very technical topic and it's something that doesn't lend itself to a lot of engagement, even more important that your conversation add some stories, add some anecdotes, add some jokes, whatever, sing a song, do something to get those people engaged. And that leads me to my next point is that we really, it makes a big difference if you can get them to interact in the chat. So if you notice tonight, we've been asking you to talk in the chat and we've answered some questions in there um, and, and live polls. Uh, one of the things that I like to do when I'm speaking live is I always ask my, put your hands up if you've ever done this. I'll start a lot of speeches with that. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this or if you've ever done this or the other, say, ask your neighbor, now, ask your neighbor if he's ever done that. And then people start talking to each other. Well, you can't really do that live, but it's an engagement process, right? And so that makes people feel like they're part of the situation. So polls, chats, Q&A during the event is really critically important. Shouting out things like that. They, all the platforms have this feature and there's no reason why you can't ask people to participate or even quizzes, uh, Jeopardy, or we're gonna do bingo, uh, online bingo at some point, just to make it more fun. Live tweeting, take requests from people or suggestions, you know, or just shout out names. You know, hey, I saw Martin was uh, shouting at Mike, you keep offering stuff for us here. That's great, I love to see that online. And then I would like to also point out that once you, when you're giving a speech, and, and again, if it's a very technical thing, this isn't always possible, but generally if, if you're telling a story or there's a very important point you'd like to get across, I always refer to it as like the Oprah moment, right? There's that point in your speech, if it's a, if it's a motivational one or if it's a heartfelt speech, or if it's even just something you're really trying to get across, that point that you want everyone to know, even if it's really dull, financial stuff. You have to make sure that you give a long pause afterwards for emphasis. Embrace that awkward silence. So let's say you have to be, let's, for instance, just to be topical, hate has no home here. That's powerful. People get quirky and they get nervous when you say something like that. Or, you know, you have to look at cash flow every day. That has an impact. People remember that because it makes them feel awkward. So the pause is critically important. You need to do that every single time. So just like in, just like in a regular meeting, you can do these things in a virtual meeting. So some of the things that I want to also cover is what happens if there's tech trouble? There's always going to be tech trouble. Melinda and I, as public speakers and, and Toastmasters, I know for a fact, and I've been doing it for 16 years now, there's always an issue. There's always something that happens, whether something doesn't come up. I've never seen one perfect. There's always some issue. I believe that most audiences are very forgiving when it comes to that, but be prepared for it. Think about tonight before this, we, we're going over all these little things that are going to come up. Is the internet right? Is this, is this form going to be coming up here? Is, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Think about that. Be intentional about it beforehand because I guarantee you it's going to happen. Do a tutorial of the platform if you've only used it a couple times before. Um, if there's a fact that you need to read somewhere, um, if you find the resources that if this does come up, like we have lights, we have all these different things, we have a microphone. Make sure that you have those things ready in the event that something happens. We had an event a couple times ago where we did it and everything crashed. Well, we switched to another computer, right? Prepare for that. 
Now, the, the last thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, recording and reviewing your, your presentation. I know a lot of people struggle with hearing themselves speak and seeing themselves speak. It's very awkward, but just like that, that, uh, that silent pause, it makes a huge difference in your next presentation if you embrace that and you watch your presentation, you think of and you see the things that you'd like to work on, you know that maybe you used a word that you shouldn't have, or maybe your physical gestures weren't the right place, whatever. Don't be afraid to do that. You don't get any better unless you get outside your comfort zone and challenge yourself to do things better. You know, I think it was Einstein said, you know, thinking that you can do the same thing over and over and get the same or better results is the definition of insanity. So you're not going to get better unless you see what you're doing in the first place. Um, so finally, um, take issue of, you know, kind of interferences that might be coming, right? Is, you know, I noticed there were planes flying over here earlier. Maybe next time we could go into a basement or, you know, maybe somebody's got a dog or something, or maybe you have children in your room. Think about those because that's going to happen. It definitely will happen. It's it's not it's not foolproof, uh, especially when you're virtual here. And uh, did, you know, and, and then finally, I'd like to also point out when those things happen, do you take a chord of them gracefully? So if, if something, oh, I dropped that. Are you angry that that happened? Are you uh, surprised? Do you do you get flustered from that? Think about that beforehand. You know, because really it should be, yeah, I've had it happen where, oh, sorry, hey, but you know what? We're going to move on. Think about the people on TV that you see, they lose their script, they ad hoc it, they, they, they impromptu it. Their demeanor doesn't change at all. You should be exactly the same. So those are things that, that I think can really help you on the virtual stage the next time you need to do something. And of course, uh, there, there's a lot of other things that we like to help you with, with Epic Communicators. And so um, I just hope that this is a good start to go. So I'm gonna leave this to, to Melinda. Thank you, Greg. So many great tips. Now I want to open it up for q and A. I know many of you have posted questions on the uh, chat, so yeah. you will notice my eyes will be looking at the chat. And so you can see the difference when you're not looking at. Well, I'll throw some the, out there. Um, Greg, if you can yeah. mute your. So, so some of the questions are, are any best practices for toggling between showing materials and speaking to the audience without materials while presenting? Yes, that is a good question. Greg, if you can mute your mic. Sorry. That'd be great. There go. <laughs> if you, I get back feed. That is a great question. And I just read something actually recently about that. So the focus should actually not be on your materials, but on you as a speaker. So how you can, and it depends on the type, if you're doing a very technical presentation and have to refer to numbers and things of that nature, maybe a little bit tricky, you, you probably will have to show it. But for the most part, you can use the slides and you use them briefly to show, for example, the points you're gonna cover in the meeting, or maybe you use them at the end, summarize the points. You use them maybe for next steps. Here are our next steps. Here's the next steps I captured. You want to have actually more face time on the screen than your slides do. You don't want to compete with your slides. And I know for work purposes, everything may be different depending on what you're presenting. So the other thing you need to do with materials is you need to practice on the platform that you are virtually speaking on because some of them can be tricky. So practice, practice, practice first. Um, I have another one, which was, which was really interesting. What, any colors in particular that are good or bad that we should wear? Well, that is, uh, that is a good question. So if you have a green screen, obviously you shouldn't wear green. You'll just sort of melt into that screen. I tend to wear, I tend to dress mo more monotone. So I don't tend to, as a woman, I don't tend to wear a multicolor top. Um, I tend to wear darker colors. It depends on your virtual background if, or your background, your background that you're in in your virtual room. I would tend to do dark colors and I would tend to just pick one color. Don't do any crazy colors. Probably more for women than for men. 
Um, and I'm going to take this one. Somebody asked, what are the, um, how do you deal with a hybrid meeting when you have people in the audience and then you're also doing it virtually? And I've actually had experience of that. And so what I've noticed is that when you present live in, in generally in meetings like that, don't, you, the, all the things that we talked about it, for virtual to work are critically important. So the technical issues, um, having the people make sure that they're, they're on uh, video as well so that you could see them. But really what you want to do is you want to present like you would live and use the virtual. So consider, make sure that you're in that area. That's the, the biggest thing is that you're going to be, if in your live, you're going to be walking around. You have to make sure that when you're doing it live virtual, that you're also staying within the camera as well. And that your voice, if you have a microphone, that your voice is within that area too. So the technical issues are, are critically important at that point. But from a presentation standpoint, I would say you need to consider all the gestures and everything that you would do live just the same and use it or pretend like you're actually only in a live event, but keep those virtual tips in mind, the technical things. And the, that will make a big difference because uh, most of the people that uh, are going to handle this virtual virtually going forward, once we go back to live, are going to be accepting of that. And they're like, okay, I get it. It's not the same experience. It's going to flip at that point. But right now, I would stick with the virtual plans. And then uh, one of the things that we saw on here were um, uh, about eating and drinking. Uh, Melinda, do you have any? Uh... Yes, and I actually just read an article on that. You know, drinking is okay. So you can have coffee, water, tea, that is okay, and I would keep, I would keep the drink off to the side. When you do drink, you know you can if, if you know need be, and you're not speaking, you can turn off your, your video feed. So basically, you have your picture, or your name up, so people don't see it. So that's an option. It isn't a bad thing to take a sip of water or take a sip of coffee. Eating is a whole nother story you should not be eating on a virtual uh, call either. Obviously when you're presenting, that would be pretty hard to eat at the same time. But when you're in a meeting and you're listening to others, I, if you're going to do that, my suggestion is you turn your video camera off and eat. But when you go back on, then I would put the food to the side and you know, not be chewing and things of that nature. That goes, let me add, I saw another question. So this parlays right. into another question on um, what? The earbuds? The earbud. well, no, there was one on earbuds, but there's one on how much should be oh. in your, I'm just gonna mute it. So how much of your person should be in a showing, video, yeah. should be showing? So you should have, um, so what I'm showing is appropriate. If you just have, this is just my face, this is too much of my face. This doesn't work. Just give me a minute here. Okay, now I'm, I've got my muting. So if you're this close, this is too close. Because all you're seeing is my face and you're probably not gonna see anything I gesture. Um, you don't want to do this where you have a floating head. So basically, I have no body. You just see my head. That's not good. I would say push the computer back far enough. This is, this is okay. Um, depending on what you're doing, I mean, I can move back even further. But I would say typically this right here is pretty good in terms of the amount of body you want on the screen. Can I just add that there was a, a world championship of public speaking over the weekend and the guy that won, if you get a chance to just Google it and you watch his speech, he did a masterclass on manipulating and using uh, video in a Zoom speaking format to, to your advantage. He did this sort of thing. He did this sort of thing. He, was, he started off down here with his face like that. He went way back like this. It was just unbelievably uh, well done. So if you want, if you're really interested in, in sort of the, the creative side of that, that's a great thing to watch. His name is Mike Carr and uh, he just won it this weekend. It was really good. So yeah, and obviously he's doing that for so it's part of his speech is part of his gimmick. Yeah. You normally wouldn't do that in a business meeting unless you want to make a point. And but normally you wouldn't do that type of of video. 
So Greg, let me look through to see if I had other questions. Yeah, Neil. We you had see, a question right. is what to do when a speaker is speaking. So if someone is speaking, should you leave your camera on, your video on or not? My suggestion is in, for example, in a situation like this, I suggest you turn your video off. You want people to be focused on the speaker, on who's speaking. Um, sometimes people don't forget, if you have your video on, you're always on camera. So if you're, whatever you're doing, straightening your hair, straightening your glasses, adjusting things, everybody sees that. You don't know who's looking at you. So, you know, my suggestion is to turn your video off when a speaker is speaking. And if you're interactive in a meeting, obviously that doesn't make sense. But when someone's presenting and it's more than five minutes, I suggest turning your video off. We also, Greg, got a question on um, light source. So when you do add a light source to, uh, to your area, to your virtual space, the light source, you should be facing the light source. So if a light source is behind you and going um, behind you, and I think I saw some comments on that, your face will look, it will be in the shadows. It, you, you can't see your face. You can't see your smiling. You can't see your eyes. So it's in the front, it's, it's in front of you is where the light source should be. So let's take a look. I think we have, may have time for one more question. There was a question about uh, earbuds. Okay, go ahead. I didn't see it. Right. So what about using a headset? Even it's earbuds with the mic and a cord. Is that taboo? So, you know, I've got one on right now. Um, obviously, you know, you're, it's a cost issue, right? At some point, it's going to be expensive to get. We've got a mic over here as well. Uh, it's not picking up from here. It's picking up from the mic, which you don't see. Uh, but I, if I wanted to use the speaker on my phone, if I wanted to or on my, uh, my computer, I could, but in the headphone, the mic on there too, but it's just not high end. It really depends on your, your level of the, the, how well that speaker is on, or the mic and the headphone is on your computer. So I use this. I think it's fine for most people. Again, it's what people are willing to accept. They're, they're very forgiving of this nowadays. Everybody seems to wear them. Now, if we're in a special board meeting and you know, you've got some really important things going on, eh, you maybe want to find a, a better way to do that, you know, rather than use the headphone. So uh, that's, that's what I would suggest. So uh, I think that's it, Melinda. Do we want to. Uh... So I just want to close and then turn over to Paulina. So Greg and I hope that you use these tips and you use these tips to pivot for success in the shifting world, and we all know the world's shifting and it's not going to be what it was like six months ago. Paulina is, is nice enough to actually sending links to the handouts, links to a video replay, and also some other things that we will share to help you accept, accept the challenge of this virtual world. So as I said in the beginning, remember this unprecedented times lead to unprecedented opportunities. You need to take massive action and be the best in this virtual world.